is Slay ASMR, an ASMR channel where every week I whisper my thoughts about a different horror movie that I love. This week's film is 1992's Candyman, directed by Bernard Rose, script from Bernard Rose based on the short story by Clive Barker from his collection Books of Blood. And the reason I chose this story, this movie, was because, as I'm sure all of you know, the new Candyman, which is a reboot slash spiritual sequel to the 1992 film we're going to be talking about today, was supposed to come out in theaters, and I, th I think it was supposed to come out all the way back in June, and it got pushed back, and it got pushed back again, and I was hoping we would get it in October. I think October 16th was the official release date, and that we would maybe get it at the drive-in. I've been going to drive-in movies a lot, uh, the Starlight Theater here in Atlanta. Um, I haven't gone inside a regular movie theater yet. I was hoping we'd get Candyman then, because I think it would actually be a really cool movie to see at the drive-thru. But alas, it got pushed back indefinitely to 2021. I think Hollywood is just going to start doing that with most movies, uh, most big budget movies anyway. Um, it just happened to Dune today. It happened to the James Bond movie. It happened to the Batman. The Batman got pushed, I think, all the way back to 2022. And that's just the reality we live in right now. Um, I'm certainly fine with it. I, I don't think it's safe to see a movie indoors right now. So I totally get it. And I get the director, Nita Costa. I get her want to have people see it the way it was meant to be seen with good sound and the camaraderie that comes with being indoors. That being said, I really wish I could see it this month, it, it being October and all. I love seeing horror movies at drive-ins, but... It is what it is, right? And so, um, hopefully we'll get it next year. I think we will. I'm an optimist. I have faith. <laughs> uh, but hey, we're not, we're not getting the new Candyman movie, so I figured we could talk about the original in honor of it. Um, I would have gotten around to this movie anyway. I love Candyman. I really do. Um, but this seemed like an appropriate month, uh, while we wait for the new one, let's talk about the old one, which is a classic at this point. A little bit of backstory before we really get into it. So, Candyman, the 1992 movie, is based on a short story from Clive Barker's Books of Blood called The Forbidden. And as is the case with a lot of Clive Barker adaptations, because his, his prose and his stories tend to be a lot sparser than the adaptations. Most of the adaptations include everything that's from the source material, so everything that happens in The Forbidden, the, the short story happens in Candyman, the movie. The big difference, though, is the location. Clive Barker, being British, uh, you know, set his story in England, and although it also takes place in a low-income housing facility, uh, there isn't the racial angle, which we'll get into a lot in just a bit with, with the film. Um, it's more it's more about class, and you could argue Candyman, the film, is also about class because racial lines are often divided among, by class, uh, unfortunately. But in, um, yeah, in Clive Barker's story, they don't really make mention of race. It doesn't really come up. It's, it's just more about the poor living conditions of the, of the people who are subject to the Candyman myth. Um, and then there's the Candyman himself. In Clive Barker's story, from what I remember, he's described almost as being uh, like yellow skin, like jaundiced and having blue lips, and a patchwork kind of coat, which Candyman in the movie, played by Tony Todd, he does have this big fur coat, but it's not really patchwork. But you don't really get any backstory on Candyman, you don't know his history, you don't know why he is the way he is. Um, the only thing you really need to know about him is that he's an urban legend, and like his film counterpart, he needs people to believe in him to exist. He needs people to be afraid of him, for him to survive, for his specter to survive. So that element is shared, and then the character of Helen, who is you know, doing her research on, 
on urban legends. And that's where the similarities end, really. The short story almost feels like an outline for the movie. The movie transports us to Chicago, namely the Cabrini Green housing project. A little bit of history about that. So when I lived in Chicago, I worked at Groupon for a long time um, as an editor there uh, for about five years. And initially the editorial office was uh, on Upper Wacker, which is, uh, if you know Chicago, it's like south of the river. But then Groupon's headquarters were in the uh, the old Montgomery Ward headquarters building, which is this really long building off of Chicago and Larrabee. And the headquarters were literally right across the street from Cabrini Green, which was a massive public housing project that was built. Um, oh gosh, I don't even know when the, the original buildings came around. Maybe in the 60s, I have no idea. But so the buildings, I think, got demolished in 2011, which is, that's a whole other thing that is too big for one Slay Smart episode to contain. But it was controversial because although there was a lot of crime in the area and the government had neglected it and it had all gone into disarray. It still was, you know, they were the homes of thousands of people and a lot of people got displaced by it being demolished. So anyway, I got hired at Groupon in 2010. The buildings got demolished in 2011 and we would have to go to the headquarters for meetings. Uh, we would get bussed over there from, from the editorial building. And I remember walking past Cabrini Green and I had seen Candyman, I loved Candyman, but I was still shocked by where Cabrini Green was actually located. Unlike a lot of federal housing projects, um, it's not, it's actually up against a very affluent neighborhood. It's kind of sandwiched uh, between Lincoln Park and the Gold Coast, which are two very wealthy Chicago neighborhoods. So I don't know, I think I, I just, being kind of an unknowing white person, I just assumed that Cabrini Green would be on the south or the west side or something. Um, the area is more traditionally associated with um, having more crime and, and poverty in Chicago. But it, it's like on the north, or it's what they call near north side. Um, so it was just this trippy experience going to this group on office building, which in many ways was also responsible for gentrification there, right? And then walking past these these towering high rises that were not in great shape and scheduled to be demolished, and I honestly knew them from a, a horror movie, a horror movie called Candyman. Um, so that's the background of of plays. Uh, you can also see Cabrini Green. I think I think good the show Good Times maybe took place there. They didn't film it there or anything, but they. Uh, they showed it in the opening credits, and Cooley Eye, which I love, which is a great 70s kind of coming of age movie, takes place there as well. But I would argue that Candyman is probably probably the most iconic and notorious usage of Cabrini Green as a location. It also was filmed in the 90s, which was the peak of, of uh Cabrini Green's reputation of being a really dangerous uh, place to live and uh, and associate with. And, I mean, when you watch the movie, they really go in there. Uh, Virginia Madsen playing the, the grad student, Ellen. Uh, her and her, her co-student, Bernadette. I mean, they, they walk right in there, uh, both inside and outside. It's, it's kind of astounding to see them actually use that physical location. So that's Cabrini Green. Uh, like I said, there's a lot more to read up on that. Um, I am by no means any kind of expert. Uh, my knowledge of it comes from reading Wikipedia and having walked by it a few times. Um, but if you if you live if you've lived in Chicago, it is kind of this storied place and really fertile ground for a, a horror movie. So Bernard Rose, the the writer director of Candyman, um, he chose to set it in Chicago because he wanted to examine race and re-watching Candyman in 2020. I feel like the movie is really getting at some things that most horror movies don't even touch and it's actually doing it in a pretty subtle, artful way, I would say. 
and maybe that sounds outlandish to you for a movie whose villain has honeybees swarming out of him and a, a severed right hand with a meat hook in place. I mean, they're very grotesque, kind of over-the-top elements in Candyman, but as talking thematically, the film is about uh, these two grad students, Helen and, and Bernadette. Helen's white, Bernadette is black, and they are uh, writing a dissertation on urban legends, um, and they hear about one called Candyman, and I'm sure if you're watching this, you know the myth of Candyman, but we're going to go over it anyway. Um, all they know at the beginning of the film is that you look in a mirror, and you say his name five times, turn off the lights, you say his name five times. Actually, I don't know if you have to turn off the lights. I think you just have to look in the mirror, and you say, you know, Candyman, Candyman, Candyman. How many times did I say it? I don't want to say it five times. <laughs> I, I don't think I've ever looked in the mirror and said it five times. My wife did. She kind of made fun of me because I was so worried about it. But I'm like, nope, not doing that. But you say his name five times. And in the tradition of Bloody Mary and a lot of other urban legends, he appears from behind you and he has this hook for a hand and slices you from groin to gullet. And uh, at the beginning of the movie, um, Bernie and Ellen are learning about all these different cases where maybe that happened. But as they talk to more people, they learn that Candyman has a really wide presence in Cabrini Green, and they think that's maybe where it originated, so they go to investigate. And the movie unfolds very gradually, and that's good. It's it's kind of a slow burn. Um, because a lot of it involves them. They're grad students, right? They're trying to find out the backstory of all this. And so the backstory they eventually uncover is that Candyman supposedly is the ghost of a, uh, a well-to-do black painter who uh, lived in Chicago in the 1900s, like the 1870s, or I'm sorry, 19th century, 1870s. And he was commissioned to paint a portrait of... Um, a wealthy landowner's daughter who was white and they developed a relationship which uh, due to the racism and bigotry in the community uh, led to the painter's death and um, what they did to him was saw off his right arm re uh, replace it with a hook coat him in honey and let bees sting him to death which was a really horrific uh, way to go obviously and they scattered his ashes on the land that would become Cabrini Green. Now, if the movie wanted to, it could it could really lean into the race angle and get really obvious with it, and I think it would still be a great movie. But the characters don't comment too much on the racial element. I mean, honestly, the most explicit thing we get is that when... Uh, Virginia Madsen's character, Helen, goes there. She gets attacked by a drug dealer who has taken on the Candyman mantle. He's not actually Candyman, he's just taken on that mantle and he knocks her out with a hook. And she tells the cops and the guy gets arrested and they make a comment how, you know, only when a white woman goes into Cabrini Green and makes a complaint and gets her to the police actually do something about it, uh, which is very relevant to today, right? So there's that comment, but as far as the the origin of Candyman himself, the characters, white and black, none of them really make too much of a fuss about the racism surrounding his death. And I actually think it serves the movie really well in a 2020 context because of everything going on, you don't need you don't need anyone to comment on it, right? I, I, and by that, I mean, you don't need the characters to point it out and analyze it because it's so in the air and it's so relevant. And when I rewatched this movie the other night, it, for the first time, I, I was thinking about the Candyman mythos and I thought to myself, it, it's such a tragedy because for a few reasons. A, obviously the way he, he got killed is really horrific and awful and then b he is haunting this community filled with with uh modern day black people and killing them so he's like he's killing his own and then on top of that no 
one believes them when they talk about these these myths, these urban legends surrounding Candyman. And that to me just really resonated with today with everything we're seeing with the police brutality and black communities not being believed a lot of the times when they report crimes and being taught to fear the law and everything because they are not believed. And, you know, I, I haven't read any interviews with Bernard Rose. I don't know how how much he was trying to tackle that, but there's no denying that that is a huge theme of the movie, the fact that these people who are already in an environment where they're getting killed quite a bit from crime and everything else that, that comes in living in, with living in this part of town, and on top of that, they have to contend with this, <laughs> this supernatural force that no one will listen to them about. And so, yeah, rewatching it this time around, I just thought that was just really palpable and something that I'm wondering if they're going to explore a little bit more in this um, this new Candyman that's coming out. I know Nia DaCosta has said that uh, I, I, th I think she's making it even more racially charged than the original was, and she's setting it in modern day Cabrini Green, which all that exists of it now, I think, are 150 of the row homes, which they weren't the high rises, they were sort of the, the low, um, the low like single homes, and I think those have even, even though they they were supposed to have been upkept, I think those have fallen into disrepair as well. But anyway, I think she has said that she's really going to tackle that even more, and I wonder if this uh, this idea of Candyman being a myth that should be believed and listened to but isn't, I wonder if that's going to come into play. I know the new one is from the trailer. It looks like it has something to do with. Um, a, a painter, a modern day painter who moves into the uh, uh, one of the, the gentrified area of Cabrini Green in one of the renovated apartments and I think he somehow summons Candyman back. Uh, once again uh, Candyman has to be talked about and whispered about and feared for him in order for him to exist, kind of like Freddy in, in that regard. Um, so I, I, so I, from the trailer it looks like it, the film is going to be very directly dealing with the uh, with Cabrini Green today, with the themes of displacement and gentrification, and I think we'll, it will put even a finer point on some of those themes. And obviously, it's you know written and directed uh, by black artists rather than um, than white artists, like the first time around. Uh, you know, a, a short story written by a white author, adapted and directed by a, a white man. Um, anyway, that. I feel like that's a lot of preamble, but it's kind of hard to talk about Candyman without talking about its greater context and where it was filmed. It's also just uh, mind-blowing to me that this movie was able to get made when it was. I mean, I, I think it's pretty subversive in how it handles race and uh, e e even taking the, the politics out of the movie. It's a very different kind of horror movie. Unlike Jason or Freddy or Michael Myers, we don't see Candyman running around and killing a lot of different people. We hear stories of people he's killed, and we see quick flashes of them. But as far as people that he like actually murders, he ends up murdering Bernadette, unfortunately, and framing Helen for it. And then we see him kill a psychiatrist that's questioning Helen once she gets institutionalized because she gets you know blamed for the murders. And that's about it. Most of the other violence it comes in flashes or it's off screen. Um, and it's weird because you get this tragic backstory about the villain, which is true. Like the backstory is not disputed. And I, I, I haven't seen the two sequels, but I think they explore that a little bit more. So they, they paint Candyman as this tragic figure. But then they also have him doing, I mean, committing horrific acts. And so, before you even meet the protagonist, or not, sorry, the antagonist, he is already this blend of just pure vengeance and brutality, but also sympathy, because we know what happened to him. And it's not just like Dracula, where it's like, oh, he, he lost his, his girlfriend, that's sad, he's lonely. It's like, no, he was killed in this really horrific, racially motivated way for doing something that you shouldn't get punished for at all, 
for doing something that should be celebrated, right? Falling in love and creating beautiful art. And so before we even see the real Candyman on screen, I just have this mixture of both revulsion and sympathy revulsion because we, I mean, we see him, the flashes of murders, we see him and they're truly gruesome. I mean, my, <laughs> for me, the scariest shot in the movie, it's really quick, but when Helen and, and Bernie are investigating uh, the Candyman stories, this little boy, Jake, tells them about uh, a public bathroom facility at the bottom of uh, one of the Cabrini Green High Rises where a, a little um, a differently abled boy was using the bathroom and Candyman comes out the toilet and um, mutilates him and does something really horrible to him. And his mom is across the street at the convenience store and uh, she sends the, she hears the screams and sends this tough guy over there to investigate and the guy looks in the bathroom and what he sees turns his hair white. And what they show, they, they show us just for a split second what he sees and we see the little boy on the floor and I, I could be wrong, but I think the way they filmed it, I think they used a mannequin or something. It doesn't look realistic and that's the point. It looks like his body has been manipulated to the point where it doesn't look real anymore. It's not even the goriest thing in the world. It's just, it's just strange looking. You just see the flash of this, this almost like mannequin completely still on the ground and then a bloody toilet and oh man it is to me the most the most horrific uh, part of the movie and so we see that we see a shot of that and we we see just these flashes of a couple other things Candyman has done that they're just awful but then we hear this story and it gets complicated right and we've got to talk about Tony Todd who plays him because then when we after Ellen thinks she's in the clear and she thinks that it was just this um, this drug dealer who was responsible for everything and he's he's incarcerated. We see the real Candyman. We meet the real Candyman, and that is Tony Todd, who has such a mix of being debonair and menacing, and oh, it is such a good performance from the moment we meet him. He just has such gravity and charisma and menace. I, it's it's kind of like a tour de force, I think, for someone who doesn't have a ton of, of screen time in the film. And I was reading, I was just doing some research, and um, so, you know, because of the honey angle and him getting stung to death, he is rib cages full of bees, and he, he kisses Helen at one point and uh, transfers bees in, into her mouth. And uh, I was reading that, that Tony Todd actually... Uh, actually put these bees in his mouth and he got paid I think a thousand dollars for every sting that he had to suffer I think he got like an extra twenty three thousand dollars because he got stung 23 times from having these these bees in his mouth and they used young bees uh so the stingers weren't quite as um potent I guess uh, and they were like least less likely to sting him uh yeah, so it seems like Tony Todd really put himself through the ringer for this role, but at the same time, I, I think he really wanted to go all out for this role. He really he vied for the part because I think he wanted to create his his version of Phantom of the Opera. It was another tragic uh, uh, villain from a, a horror property, right? My only issue with this movie, and I think more than anything, this is... Uh, emblematic of 90s horror in general because of Bram Stoker's Dracula which came out around this time they go into this whole thing with Helen being the reincarnation of Candyman's uh, dead lover and I don't know I just think the logic gets really messy once you do something like that I mean it works a little bit better in Dracula because Dracula is so theatrical and over the top but here it's I feel like it actually robs Helen of her agency a little bit because before you know that, she's just a grad student who's trying to get to the bottom of this and help a community and really do things for herself and move forward. But then if she's this reincarnation and she's able to get hypnotized by him and it's the, it becomes this weird kind of love story, then I feel like she's operating under forces that are not in her control, which gives her less control. And then you're like, well, so is she the actual reincarnation of... 
Candyman's a dead lover, or does she just look like her and that's attractive to Candyman? And if it's the former, then it it's like, well, wait, is the only reason she was interested in Cabrini Green to that have to do with predestination? It just, I don't know, it muddies the waters a little bit, and for me, it's much less interesting than all the other background about Candyman. I mean, I don't mind that he, I, I like that he, uh, died for this interracial romance. Once again, I think that plays into the socio-political themes of the movie, but, uh, like, I don't mind that being a story element, but connecting Helen to it, I don't, I don't know, it just doesn't quite land for me and just makes things a little confusing. Um, and at the end, of course, she sacrifices herself in this bonfire that the residents of Cabrini Green are lighting, um, after Candyman lures her into it with this, this baby he stole, she's going to save the baby, and Candyman wants them to be, uh, sort of, um, ensconced in urban folklore forever, and so they can be together, so she follows him, and, uh, she actually ends up escaping the fire with the baby, um, and I, I guess it kind of defeats Candyman, at least temporarily, or getting out of the fire. But then what you see at the end is a painting of her, and she she's she's kind of the new Candyman, right? She's part of the lore, and she actually goes and takes revenge on her scumbag uh, professor husband who's been cheating on her the whole movie with the grad student. And at the movie at the end, he says her name five times in despair in the mirror after she's dead, and she goes back with a hook and you know, kills him. And so, uh, anyway, and I like that about it too. I like her becoming part of the lore, but I think you can get that without the whole reincarnated love angle. I'm going on kind of a, a side note tangent now, but I actually don't even like it that much in Bram Stoker's Dracula. I mean, I think it fits the movie aesthetically a little bit better just because it's so theatrical, but in the original book for Dracula, romance had nothing to do with it. Dracula is more or less a parasite, um, a leech. He's not going after Mina and Lucy or whoever because he thinks they're the reincarnations of his, his dead wife. He's just going after them because he goes after them. He's just, he's much more of a, a menacing character in the book. Um, so yeah, maybe I'm just not big on the whole reincarnated lost love thing. I think it's, it's kind of an easy trick. Um, but I don't want to harp on that too much because once again, I, I think this is such an excellent different horror movie. We should also mention Philip Glass's score. I always forget that he does the score every time I watch this movie, and it's, uh, the opening theme is really prevalent in the credits. It's just this, you see a, a bird's eye view of Chicago, and, you know, just Lakeshore Drive, and, you know, how, sort of like, all, some of the different neighborhoods near Cabrini Green on the near north side. Um, and I've always associated Philip Glass more with you know, his minimalist, um, almost peaceful, soothing, quirky, for lack of a, of a better word, compositions, but here, um, it's funny, Tony Todd references Fam of the Opera, because here, it's very gothic sounding, it's very, almost over the top for, for Philip Glass, maybe, I, I don't know a ton about Philip Glass, Glass's work, other than his film score, so, maybe I'm mistaken, and he, and, he has a lot of stuff like this, but what really strikes me is that this score could almost be in a, a hammer film. It feels like it's all pipe organ and choirs. It's very, yeah, it's very over the top and, and lush. And I think of a cathedral when I hear it works really, really well. So I feel like he's kind of going against what he's usually associated for here. Another quick bit of Chicago trivia. I mean, Chicago's like my favorite city in the world. It's my favorite place I've lived. And, uh, which is probably why I also like Candyman, um, just because I recognize a lot of the locations and I, I just like stories about Chicago. And, and there, there's a good deal of horror movies that have to do with Chicago. I mean, Stuart Gordon came out of the Organic Theater Company in Chicago, and uh, the first Child's Play was filmed there in an apartment uh, in Lincoln Park, not too far from where Cabrini Green was. Um, but I think, I feel like, Candyman is the most Chicago of the Chicago horror movies. It, maybe you could argue Halloween because Haddonfield's supposed to be sort of near Chicago, but when I think of the Chicago horror movie, I think of Candyman. Um, but yeah, so another piece of Chicago trivia, there's a great theater company called uh, Manual Cinema, and what they do is they use 
use a mixture of live silhouettes and shadow puppetry to create these kind of, to recreate um, film shots on stage. So they do a lot of original stories, but they're on a screen and they're almost composed the way a film would be, but right in front of you. They do great work and uh, I know a few people who, who tour with them and design puppets for them. And they created a Candyman trailer that's separate from the official trailer. Um, I think they actually, from the looks of it, I think they did some of the animation in the movie too. Um, but this other trailer, it's uh, it's quite gorgeous. It actually, sh so it shows the origin story of Candyman in, um, you know, with these cardboard shadow puppets. Um, but then they pair that up with uh, other hate crimes toward black men throughout throughout history um kind of subtly all tying it together and it doesn't i don't think it spoils anything from the upcoming movie it's more just showing that i think this film is going to lean like i said even more heavily into that that uh racial angle and um yeah i have a few f i i didn't know this until i looked at the credits who worked on it and i think they probably had to keep hush hush about it but um yeah, some of my friends who are in, involved with manual cinema worked on it and did some of the puppeteering, so definitely check it out. It's super cool. I didn't see it till today. Um, and and the fact that they used a Chicago company, manual cinema, to do that, I think just speaks volumes to this being a Chicago horror movie and Nia DaCosta and her team really doing their homework. Obviously, I haven't seen the movie, but I'm really excited for it. And I can't wait for it. I would say that and Dune were probably the films I was most excited about this year. And we're going to have to wait till next year to get both of them, which, once again, I understand. Um, in the meantime, I'll, I'll be watching a lot of stuff at home and checking out uh, Possessor at the drive-in, which is from David Cronenberg's son. That's playing here, and I bet it's really good. I'm also interested in this other this Italian horror movie. It's an Italian monster movie. Uh called Shortcut that I saw a poster for. Anyway, we're not talking about those movies right now. We are talking about Candyman, and we are actually done talking about Candyman. That's that's my piece on it. Um, once again, so excited for the, the new one to come out next year. Um, it seems like it's doing everything right, and I like that they don't show Tony Todd in the trailer. I know he's in it. I know he's playing Candyman, but I wonder if they're gonna, if he's, they're gonna lean into him being more aged, or if they're altering him some uh, some kind of way. It's one of the few trailers that really, I think, shows a lot of what the movie's going to do thematically, but also keeps its cards really close to its chest, so I'm stoked for it. Hopefully this episode has uh, been a little, um, a little placeholder until it comes out. I'm not equating myself with a Candyman movie. I know, I know. <laughs> this is just me talking to a camera, but, uh, Hopefully just getting to hear my thoughts about it and maybe sharing some of your own in the comments section will um, tide us over until whenever Candyman comes out. That's all I have today, everyone. Um, thank you so much for watching. Like I said, like, subscribe, spread the word. Uh, we hit 50 subscribers this week, and I know their channels with way more people than that, but I was really excited. Number 50, it was a big deal to me. So thank you for watching and uh, hopefully falling asleep and getting relaxed by all this um we're in october season I've, we've got plenty more spooky movies to talk about throughout the month so stay tuned uh next week for a new episode and in the meantime get some rest don't have nightmares except for the good kind and i'll see you next time